if you, if you actually multiplied out, you know, 100 quadrillion times a 60 watt light bulb, you would end up with more power than we could actually provide to you in terms of consumables that you could eat and generate the power for, so that your brain can function. There's all kinds of things that we could actually talk about with respect to how a computer works. You guys actually demonstrated the interconnect of the core processors by taking the paper and moving it from one person to the other person. On Titan, we have a three-dimensional interconnect, which means that the numbers can come in from the left or the right, or up in front or the back or the top or the bottom. And so the, each of those processors are connected by a three-dimensional torus, and data can flow in each of those directions. And it can actually happen simultaneously. The data can be flowing all the time at a very high bandwidth. Okay, so that's how Titan is configured. We could also talk about the latency at which communications arrive. The longest latency, well, got kind of stuck up over here in HR land, but the longest latency is when it went from over here at this side of the table to over here. And it's the same kind of thing with Titan. There's a latency associated with the communications and the length of the cables that connect the processors to each other. Okay? So there's lots of analogies that we can draw here. And we could actually fill up the pipeline, and everybody could be adding, and we could actually increase our performance. It's a good thing that our brain does other things besides adds and multiplies. That what, that's what makes us human. And that's what makes us very hard to duplicate with respect to a computer technology. It's, a, it's uh, projected that if we had an exaflop, okay, tens of exaflops of a computer, we could actually start to simulate what the brain would require in terms of capability. Okay? So we have a computer that does 17.59 petaflops worth of performance for 8.9 megawatts. And it turns out that that's one of the most efficient computers in the world, the third most efficient computer in the world. Okay? And so we actually do about 2,100 computations per watt. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Titan today. That's what we're here for. 2,100 million. Well, I'm going to get there. So let me back up now and talk a little bit about um, computing. Okay? Most of you know that computing is one of many facilities that we have in our arsenal to attack scientific problems. And here's some examples of other facilities. There's the old picture of Jaguar, which was at 1.759 petaflops of sustained performance. And so it's been replaced by Titan. But we also do a lot of things in neutrons, with nuclear science and technology, material sciences and engineering, with the idea that we can actually, that's not good. with the idea that we can provide information about clean technology and about uh, basic sciences that we're interested in. Let me see if I can get this back in. There we go. So the idea, let me see if I can get this laser pointer to work, is that we're doing clean energy, scientific discovery and innovation, and global security. Okay, so we apply these kinds of tools, and our idea is that we have very large facilities, Lots of people doing multidisciplinary science, multi-institutional projects in order to make an impact in clean energy, scientific discovery, innovation, and global security. We have lots of strengths. We have signature in this column, and we have lots of areas that we have these, these areas. Now, one thing that's important for you to realize, and a lot of times um, you may not think about how we actually do scientific discovery. It turns out that if you go back a thousand years, we did experiments. You know, you, you remember the apple that dropped on Newton's head? That was kind of an experimental uh, type of uh, scientific discovery. And we, we were, good at, were good at doing experiments. In fact, we do a lot of experiments here at the laboratory. But then we started to write down um, equations, theories, that would explain how those experiments work. And so we have a lot of theoretical uh, capabilities here at the laboratory as well. We have the formulations that tell you why the apple actually can fall out of the tree and drop down and hit you on the head. And we can write down those kinds of equations. And then about 50 years ago, we started to do simulations with computers. Okay, now these computers were not nearly as powerful as that we have them today. They were about as powerful as the demonstration that we just did here a little while ago. But those computers allowed us to do simulations in a way that would tell us something about the science that we were trying to discover. And so we actually come up with this idea that we would have uh, simulations of complex phenomena. You know, 30 years ago, I was a graduate student, and I was working in the area of computational chemistry. 
And we had a, a new, a brand new VAX 11780 that came into our department, and it was able to do one megaflop, okay? One megaflop. So 30 years ago, now this was Texas A&M University, new member of the SEC, did pretty good. Maybe at Alabama, okay? All right, so that's a hurrah, you know? So that computer, though, 30 years ago, one megaflop, one million floating point operations in one second. How many people have a smartphone in their pocket? These smartphones do 150 million floating point operations in one second. That's why they're called smart, okay? So these phones, so the technology that we have today, in many ways, is a function of where we go in high-performance computing and state-of-the-art technologies. It trickles down. So it took 30 years to trickle down from a one megaflop VAX 11780, but here we are sitting with a 150 million floating-point operations per second smartphone. All right? So we have, we have capability today in simulation that we never dreamed of 30 years ago. And then look at this one, data. How many people have heard about big data? What does big data mean? Does it mean that this device has, you know, 32 gigabytes of memory or 32, 64 gigabytes of memory? Is that big data? Terabyte is big data. Terabytes is big data. Titan currently has 10 petabytes of spinning disk on it. Is that big data? It moves it at 250 gigabytes per second to Titan. Is that big data? All of that is big data. Titan has 710 terabytes of physical memory. All right? That's big data. If you start to load all of the memory with data and you start to crunch on data and you try to understand the data analytics associated with your problem, that's big data. If you would start to move it around, so storage, moving the data around, doing the analytics, doing the data um, analytics that would actually tell you something about the science is big data. There are those that would say 200 terabytes of data that I want to understand the relationships of is a big data problem. Okay, so that's big data. Well, it turns out that the science associated with data, of understanding that data, has become another area that we have had to uh, grow our expertise in. And it turns out that we've done that and we have about 150 people in the computing directorate that focus on data, big data, all right? So now we have four areas of science that we have to think about. This just says that um, data has, is the fourth paradigm and has joined experiment theory and simulation as a fourth area of discovery. Now, computing, what we say is that we want to provide the facilities, the, the, the big iron, um, the biggest iron in the world to those people that are trying to do discovery and experiment and theory and simulation and data, okay? And we have a, a well, we have a, a very good, well-defined path to doing that. And we've been doing it. We had the biggest machine back in 2009. We have the biggest machine today, okay? So we have a well-defined path for doing that. Now, it turns out that you can't just do the science if you have a big machine, so it turns out you have to have the mathematicians and the computer scientists and the comp computational scientists that can work together to figure out how to actually do the simulations. It turns out that the numbers that you, ca you calculated here, the numbers that you added, I could have written down a formula for you and added it up in about 10 seconds. Because all I did was I took 1.0 plus 1.1 plus 1.2 plus 1.3 plus 1.4. So if you actually looked at those numbers, you could figure out how to add them up and you could get the right answer very quickly. That's an example of mathematicians that would actually be able to write down an equation that would do the analytics for you and come up with an equation to solve the problem without having to go down and march down through the HR folks and everybody else that was adding up those numbers. Okay, we could have avoided that. But we need those kinds of people. And so it turns out that these kinds of people are not always in East Tennessee. And so we have to go find them. We have to recruit them. We have to train them. We have to educate them. And we have to grow them. And so these HR folks are extremely valuable because they help us find these people and bring them here to the laboratory. Okay, they can't add, but they can find people. <laughs> these are my HR people, so I can, I can uh, give them trouble. All right, so that's, the, that's what we're doing. Now, it turns out that we have about 600 people in computing. Okay, that's this lower area of the triangle. We have 600 people in facilities and systems. We have about 
and, and in mathematics and computer science and computational sciences, and in cyber and IT. We have about 600 people that do that and support the various discovery areas here at the laboratory. Okay? And so what we do is we say we support experiment, theory, simulation, and data in this way in order to do scientific discovery in order to actually that's what we're trying to do and that's what we're really good at at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. All right now doing big science okay is what Titan is all about and if you haven't thought about it you know we we talk about um, inter advanced energy systems that could be Castle you know, Castle is trying to build a virtual reactor so that we can understand nuclear energy and actually make it more long-lived and grow our reactors and make more of them and make our fuel more efficient and burn hotter and give off less waste. Okay, so we have advanced energy systems. We, have, we do a lot of work in climate change. We try to understand what causes the Sandy-like events and try to figure out what's, when's the next one that's going to happen. Okay, we try to do risk mitigation or you know, mitigation strategies and adaptation uh, strategies with a function of our climate change. Renewable energy sources and secure and resilient electric grid, these are all also very important to us in order to understand our new economy okay, our, and our energy economy and try to understand uh, how to move forward in a way that's very sustainable. Now, it turns out this is, an, uh, this is actually, what this is doing is saying that in computing, we've reached certain barriers that we can't overcome, okay? It turns out that it, we can add more and more transistors. This is that line right there. We can keep adding transistors. And so you've seen ex examples of that in your laptop and in your smartphone. The we, can, we can actually make, put more and more billions of transistors okay, on a die, and that's actually saying that we can get more and more computing in fact, what we would say is that our, 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 our path forward is to double our performance every 18 months. That's what Moore's Law says. But it turns out that if you looked at the clock rate okay, of your processor, you'll see that it's fallen off. Okay? It's pretty stagnant at about 2 gigahertz now. It quit increasing around 2003. And it's really the power that's been constraining us in terms of being able to grow that, to, to crank up that processor. So what we do is we add more and more of those cores, more and more processors, and that's what's generated the massively parallelism that we've had to worry about um, as we move forward. Let's see, I'm, I'm going too quick here. Okay, now this is Jaguar. Okay, so Jaguar um, had a peak performance of 3.3 petaflops. It was 1.759 sustained petaflops in performance. Um, it actually took 5.1 megawatts, that's without cooling, Okay, that's how much it was when it, before we cooled it down. And um, each megawatt is equivalent to about 1,000 homes. And so you can say that Jaguar was roughly equivalent to a 5,000 home community, the power of it. It's real dollars. We actually write out to TVA a check for a million dollars for every megawatt year that we consume. So we write out a check to make, to, for Jaguar, we would write out a check for $5.1 million to TVA to pay them for the power. Okay, and then we have to write them out another check for about another million and a half to two million to cool it down. Five thousand homes. Okay, so what what we could have done was to say, if I want to build a twenty petaflop system, I'm going to basically just take six Jaguars, six two hundred cabinets. I would just take six of those, twelve hundred cabinets, and I could build a Jaguar, a Titan from Jaguar-like objects and it would cost me 30 megawatts, 30,000 homes, okay? Now I'm starting to get real money, a billion dollars here, no, a million dollars here, a million dollars there, and pretty soon it gets to be real money. Do I have $30 million that I can write a check to TVA? No. Do I have a big enough computer floor that I could put six Jaguars on the floor? No, okay? So what has to happen? We have to do something, something in terms of innovation in order for us to be able to do these kinds of calculations. This is a, a climate change uh, calculation that requires quadrillions of parallel computations per second. So what do I do? Well, I look elsewhere for my computer technologies, my processor technologies. It turns out that there are other processing technologies out there. There were some that are in the gaming community. Now, they didn't start out to do adds and multiplies like you guys did when you 
took your papers and went down the row. What they were really good at was actually doing the, doing the uh, painting your screen on your display. That's what the GPUs were really good at. But it turns out that those very nice processors that were used for that could be used for floating point operations. And so the gaming industry, several years back, started putting in the registers that would allow them to do the ads and the multiplies like you guys did, okay, into their processor. And it turns out that they can do um, a lot more processing a lot more cheaply. Now, it turns out that this is good for us because we can take this $26 billion market in the gaming community and let them build processors that we can use for science. Okay, a perfect trade-off. So what we did back in 2009 was make a deal kind of with NVIDIA. NVIDIA is the guy that manufactures those GPU processors that are in most of your laptops and desktops. Okay, so what we did was, and here's a, here's a um, this is a actual blade that was in Jaguar. These are really heavy, by the way. So, and so in this blade, there were four nodes. Each node was two sockets. Okay, each of these were filled with x86 processors. So we had eight of these processors on every blade like this, four sockets. Okay, it turns out that if you, this is an actual blade out of Titan. Okay, and so if you look at Titan today, we actually have replaced, okay, I didn't show you this one, up on top are the interconnect, uh, the interconnects to the various nodes, that's these guys here, and if you looked under the cover here, you would see we have four x86 processors and four GPU processors. Okay, so each node has both an, a CPU, a 16-core Interlagos processor, and a Gemini Kepler processor. Okay? And it turns out that the Gemini Kepler, sorry, the NVIDIA Kepler processors, the GPUs, are 10 times more powerful than the x86 CPUs. So now if we look back you know, at the slide before when we say, what could we do with Jaguar in order to get from three petaflops to say 30 petaflops, I can take out half my x86 processors and replace those with Kepler GPUs and I get a factor of 10 in performance at roughly the same energy cost. Okay, pretty clever, huh? What's the cost? Well, it turns out that the way that you program these things, okay, this guy is a 16 core processor. This GPU acceler accelerator is actually, if you think about it, it's got about 3,000 micro cores in it. Okay? So there are some examples of computational scientists that are in the room here that are having to worry about how do I expose the parallelism in my computation to take advantage of this 3,000 micro core object when it used to be a 16 core object. And so the amount of parallelism in, the, in Titan has gone from something like 300,000 way parallelism to something on the order of 50 million way parallelism. And so the jobs of the computational scientists, the folks that are writing codes for climate and, and fusion and fission and biology, they have to expose the parallelism in their applications from 300,000 to now 50 million. So, and they can't use their grandmother's Fortran to do it. Okay? How many people learned how to program in BASIC or Fortran back in the day? Okay? How many people used cards and a card reader? Okay? Paper tape. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> Paper tape. Okay? Um, did you guys raise your hand? You should have. You should have learned how to program. <laughs> so the, the object, though, is that we have to convert ourselves from our thinking in terms of Fortran and C and C++ to expose the parallelism with, a, uh, with an, a software called CUDA, a programming model called CUDA. And so now our programmers have to learn C and C++ and CUDA and in addition to their Fortran in order to be able to use the exposed parallelism that we have 
in these, um, in these machines. And so we use something called the hybrid programming model. And so we actually use then the program, the programming model allows us to use the CPU where it does things very well and the GPU for things that it does very well. And so then we can get this kind of an object called Titan, which is 27.1 peak petaflops, 17.59 sustained high performance limb pack petaflops. And this is actually what was awarded to Oak Ridge National Laboratory at, in Salt Lake City in Utah just in November. Okay, and so this is the this is a picture of Titan, and somewhere I think I had a picture of the uh, Titan laid out on a basketball court, so you can kind of get an idea. Each there's there's about 200 cabinets um, in Titan, all right, and each and now you can start to see how we come up with the 710 terabytes and 8.9 megawatts. But if you look at Titan and how it's laid out on the basketball court, there's 200 cabinets, eight rows of 25. Each cabinet's about the size of a refrigerator. And so you can get some feel for how big Titan is. But that doesn't include all of the data storage that we need for Titan. Okay? And so actually we're in the process of upgrading that as well. And so this is the number one machine in the world. Okay? And it's also green because it does, so, it's so powerful. And yet, and you might say, well, 8.9 megawatts is a huge amount of power. But if you think about it, we're actually sustaining 17.59 Okay, petaflops for this amount of power. And so our job as good stewards of the Department of Energy and the taxpayer is to make sure that we use this resource to solve grand challenge problems, the most significant problems that the nation faces. And so we do that by awarding tens of millions of CPU hours to those applications um, that, are, uh, that go through peer review every year through the Insight call and they actually then are awarded by panels of uh, academy, uh, academy fellows that can actually judge their technical merit as well as their scientific merit. So this is just saying that AMD and, and uh, NVIDIA, we've partnered those two companies together with Cray and Oak Ridge National Laboratory in order to provide this kind of capability. Okay? Now, remember when I talked to you about the, the uh, how that they were all the... Uh, the the uh, information went from one processor to the other, and you guys were passing in from the paper back and forth. This is actually saying that this is what a this is what a um, a node looks like. So we have an interconnect here where information is moving in six different uh, ways. Okay, it's three dimensional torus, and it's connected to each socket. Okay, there's an NVIDIA processor in that socket, an AMD processor in that socket. It goes through a an interconnect, a Gemini interconnect, in order to move the information back and forth between these various sockets. And so that's how, um, how Titan works today. Okay? It's called a Cray XK7 system. If you look at it underneath the, underneath the covers, if I opened up that door right there, you would see 24 blades, three rows of eight blades each that look like this. Okay? Each of these, there's 24 of these in each of the cabinets. There's a great big fan at the bottom of the cabinet that's just blowing cold air up through these blades. And then at the top, there's actually a, um, something that looks like a, a, a radiator of your car that's actually exchanging the heat and taking the heat off uh, from a cooling system. Okay? So the first thing that we did, the first phase that we did was to replace all of these boards at the beginning of the year. We replaced all of these boards with boards that look like this with no Kepler GPUs in them. And so that was what phase one looked like. Okay? Phase two is we took those blades out again because the Keplers weren't really made until this fall. And so we took the blades out and populated each of the blades with Kepler processors, Kepler GPUs. Okay? So Titan's power and cooling <laughs> We actually have, if you were to go downstairs of the computer room and you were to go into one of the uh, rooms where we have our transformers, you would see that there's great big red lines that come in. And these are the same power lines that come in from the TVA uh, substation. Great big 13,800 uh, volt lines, big red lines that are about this big. Then they go through a step-down transformer that actually converts that 13,800 into 480 watts which uh, go to each of the cabinets. Okay? 
And so that actually happens right close to the computer room, and so it saves us money because we don't have very much line loss associated with those, cab with those cables going to each of those cabinets. And so we have very efficient power and cooling. I told you about how the, how the cabinets are cooled by air cooling and liquid cooling, and we have very good uh, efficient electricity coming into the, uh, into the computer room. And we actually have backup power associated with the system as well. Now, we don't have the kind of backup power that keeps the machine going if we take a hit. You know, if, an, if lightning strikes, we, we have about 2.5 megawatts of backup power. Okay? And that actually helps us to keep the network and the servers and those kinds of things going um, while the machine is rebooted. <laughs> okay? And so these are the kinds of things that we have. Now, we have a very efficient computer room. Okay, the power utilization efficiency, this PUE is 1.25. That, in the way that I say it, is that for every 1.25 units of energy that you put in, you get one unit of technology out. Another way to say it is that we don't waste a lot of energy on the cooling infrastructure. Okay, and so we have one, a 1.25 PUE, and that's one of the best, most efficient, most sustainable computer rooms in the country. Okay, other computer rooms are typically 1.75, 1.8, these kinds of things. This is the Ecoflex technology, which I talked about, which allows us to cool each of these cabinets. This is the, how you would actually calculate your PUE. Okay? And this is 1.8 PUE indicates that the cost uh, by, of removing the heat from the system plus ancillary cooling and light loads is another 80% of the cost um, just for the electricity consumed by the systems themselves. Ours is 1.25, not 1.8. So this is a very good PUE for Oak Ridge. Okay, so what do we do with, what, what do we do with um, this big machine? Well, these are six examples of codes that we already have running um, on Titan. So we do things like material sciences. We do calculations uh, with a code called LSMS that would allow us to understand uh, materials. We do uh, codes with, uh, like astrophysics, NRDF. We do, um, we do astrophysics. Most of you would uh, uh, realize that we've been doing both materials and astrophysics for quite some time. Climate change as well with a code called CAMSE. Combustion with uh, S3D. That's a code that comes out of the Sandia uh, Combustion Research Facility. LAMPS is a code that's used for uh, molecular dynamics, biology, biofuels, and then the nuclear energy uh, code called the Noble that's used within Castle. So six applications are already running on this big machine called Titan. Okay, and we're already seeing performance that's that shows that you know we could have taken the more traditional route and filled up every one of these sockets with a new uh, with the with the Interlagos processor. We could have made the equivalent of this guy with x86s, but then we would have only had how much performance would we have had? Do you, do you know? We would have had about five petaflops of peak performance. But it turns out by putting the, the Kepler GPUs in here, we have a 30 petaflop machine, peak petaflop machine. So we should see something on the order of, on the order of six times more capability if you look at this blade to this blade. Okay? And you're already seeing that we can, we can demonstrate that we're getting better, okay, then if we had just put in x86 processors, we're getting speed ups of 1.8, it's the smallest, but up to 7.4 and 3.8 on some other ones. So we're doing a really good job of utilizing those blades that contain those, both those Kepler GPUs and um, AMD CPUs. Okay, that's not the end of the story. I've got a few more minutes, I'm gonna tell you about an, another uh, green machine. So Titan is the number three on the green 500. So it's the number one most powerful machine in the world, and it's the number three machine in the world in terms of the green 500. What's the number one machine on the green 500? You guys can't answer. You can't answer. You can't answer either. What's the number one machine on the green 500? It's here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in UT. Nope. Do you know? We can give you another hint. We, it came out of this effort, this ongoing effort, the Application Acceleration Center of Excellence. I can give you another hint. It was origin, it's a, a machine that's built by APRO, and it has Intel mic processors in it. 
You know the name of that machine? I'll give you another hint. Okay? Who said that? Do you work for me? I was going to say, if you work for me, you can't, you can't answer. Beacon is the right answer. Okay? Beacon is the number one machine on the top 500. And it looks like this. It's actually got nodes that are both has x86 and mic processors. Mic, the mic accelerator is like the NVIDIA GPU, only it's not. It's a many core processor. Okay? It's a, um, if you look at this is the, this is actually what the Beacon system uh, contains, and it contains both Intel and Xeons and Xeon, what's called Xeon fees, those are the mic processors. And those chips are like NVIDIA GPUs in the sense that they're a teraflop type capability chip. Okay? They're a little bit more traditional in the sense of how many processors they have or microcores that they have, but they're very similar. But it turns out that they are slightly more energy efficient. Now, Beacon is not nearly as big as, um, as, as Titan is, but it is more energy efficient than Titan is in terms of how many uh, mega, mega, mega flops per watt it actually provides. So it's a custom high performance limb pack implementation. It's um, optimized for core four mics per node, four of these um, accelerators per node. It utilizes dynamic power management. And uh, we've been working with Intel in order to do this uh, capability over the past several years. And this is going on inside the Joint Institute for Computational Sciences associated with the NSF project, the National Institute for Computational Sciences. Okay? And so we did all the measurements. Glenn Brooks, actually, and his team did all the measurements. And they actually, if you look at the power consumption as you run the code, this is the profile that you would see. And it turns out that you would end up with 2.499 gigaflops per watt at 71.4% efficiency. Okay? Now, one last topic that I want to cover before I, uh, I'll open it up to questions is, you know, we talked about um, the world's number one machine being Titan, and, and it's number three on the green 500. We talked about Beacon being the number one uh, green machine on the, on, the, uh, on the green 500. But we also have goals from an IT perspective to make ourselves at Oak Ridge more energy efficient. Okay? So one of the sustainability goals that we have here at the laboratory is to use our, our, um, our IT in a way that would allow us to maximize our energy efficient, efficiency by the way that we use our computers and our computing equipment to meet our business objectives, the way that we use our printers. And most of you know that we've connected our printers on, on networks, and we, we try to be more, much more efficient in how we utilize these uh, printers, promote electronic stewardship, and support telecommuting. Did you hear what I said about supporting telecommuting? OK. Now, how do we do that? Well, one, one way we did it was to implement a thing called Verdium. And Bob, that's your project, right? Or one of them in your, in your uh, um, division. And so what it does is actually looks at your system on your desktop and actually allows it to go to sleep and not utilize energy when you're not there. Okay? And it can turn, it on, turn your system on and off. It can be programmed to, to, to turn on before you get to work and turn off shortly after you go off. And it can do all of these kinds of things, and it actually saves us a lot of money. So if you look at this implementation, it's actually saved us $878,000 since we've implemented it. We, we saved $241,000 okay, in our energy bill just this year in 2012. So those are things that we can do in order to save a lot of money. Okay? Now, I didn't tell you that what we have coming into the computer room is about 25 megawatts of power. Okay? We don't want to waste that power if we're not using it efficiently. And these are things that we can do in order to use our power in a way that would maximize our performance. It doesn't impact our efficiency. It impacts the efficiency of our electrical um, utilization. Um, we also have other policies that IT is interested in pursuing in order to reduce our cost, and cost of our energy. So things like um, a managed hard hardware program, 
uh, mandatory screen savers, managed power for all desktops, uh, duplex, default duplex printing, and energy saving power strips. All of those things will help us save thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in terms of our energy costs. And it really doesn't um, impact our, our efficiency in terms of producing science. It just is less costly. Okay? So those are the policies that we have in place. And those are the policies that we're pursuing. My wife, who is in this program of sustainability, she tells me, gives me these little tips every now and then. She'll say, you know, if you set your printer to print using, what's the, what is it? Century Gothic. Century Gothic. Anybody heard of Century Gothic? What good is it? What, what is its benefit? Century Gothic. What does it do for you? You can read it, and it uses how much less ink? It's about what, 30%? So if those of you that are at home and you're trying to maximize the number of pages that you can print, thank you, the number of pages that you can print before your printer runs out of ink, you set it on, what is it? Century Gothic. Century Gothic. Write that down. You'll actually use 30% less toner. Okay, in your printer. So things like that are very cool. And there are takeaways that you can use in order to help yourself at home as well as to reduce our uh, utility bills. All right, 10 minutes to spare. Questions? What kind of questions do you have about Titan or Beacon or IT? Dan? Yeah. Well, so that's a good question. So um, if you think about how we actually attacked the problem of data and how do we know what's right with regards to other experiments, one, one, way, to, one way to look at it is, well, validation and verification is extremely important. So you validate your models with experiments where possible, but remember that when we started, when we stopped doing nuclear explosions, okay, back several years ago, the three weapons labs, Sandia and Los Alamos and Livermore, they started being able to simulate those explosions and looking at the data in order to make decisions about stockpile stewardship. And so they had, this was a very important question for them. They had to validate those simulations and their data based on either experimental observations that they had already done with respect to these bombs, or experiments that they could build like NIF at Livermore that would actually help them validate their models and actually give them confidence that the data that they were looking at was correct. So validation and verification is extremely important uh, with regards to the, the uh, being able to have confidence in your data analysis. But that's, you're working from things that you already know something about. So we're getting into mm -hmm. your Yeah. So another example, um, another an easy another easy analogy is in climate. How do we know that our climate change models are accurate, right? So what do we do? We run we run our models backwards and forwards. We run them backwards to try to make sure that we understand and can predict or look back and see if our predictions were correct, and then look forward. And then we also look for the um, convergence of those of those algorithms and those models based on having different. A starting parameters. So we look at the statistical uh, analysis of, of those same kinds of models. So, um, so it's a very important problem. And, it, and, and you could take an argument that you don't trust climate change for exactly the reason that you're, that you're um, bringing to bear, the, the question that you're bringing to bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was... <clears throat> Go ahead. I was kind of curious as to... You had these six different applications No, the, we've been working on these for about 18 months, so they didn't just come over. 
right? So they were, we had to re rewrite most of them. So we call it uh, refactoring, restructuring, those kinds of things. And so when you're, you're, you, the, the idea is that you have to expose almost every aspect of parallelism in those codes that you can in order to run them on these big machines that have 50 million threads, for example. So you have to rewrite most of the codes. Most of the codes will not run efficiently unless they've already been restructured or refactored to uh, expose the parallelism. Tens of millions, okay? These codes are, are millions of lines of code, okay? And so they are, you're rewriting, you know, the, the code that I'm familiar with, but I, I worked on a code called NWChem, and it was probably 10 million lines of code. Some of it's uh, actually machine-generated code. Yeah, so the target is to make sure that each of these applications can run at scale on all of Titan, okay? So um, these, they, they probably not, are, are not running at scale yet, but they are running at least at significant fractions of Titan, you know, 50%. No, so what I mean is, is that our, the goal for Titan, okay, is that when a user comes on Titan, that they can run on 25% of the machine, at least. Okay, so that means they're running on something on the order of, um, you know, a uh, six petaflop machine or, or more. In fact, what we really like is to solve national problems by using the whole machine because you get the benefit of the, the network costs a lot of money, right? So you want to be able to use the whole machine and actually do it as quickly as possible and move on to the next, on the next one. So the target for these six applications is running on the whole machine. And in some cases, they are running at scale, okay? Like high performance limb pack, that the benchmark that actually achieved 17.59 petaflops was run on the whole machine, right? And so we would expect all of the applications to run like that. Yeah. Is there any information on the uh, optimum ratio of CPUs to GPUs in Titan, or is uh, Titan the expression of uh, that ratio? So the, the, the ratio on Titan is one to one one CPU, one GPU. Okay? On Beacon, it's really, there's two x86 CPUs and four accelerators per node. So that ratio is two to four or one to two. Okay, so it's different. And that's why their efficiency is a little higher than, than the uh, Titan system. Now, it, it, again, that one, that you could have, you could actually have many more accelerators per CPU as long as you can expose the parallelism in an appropriate fashion. Okay? And that's going to be somewhat algorithm dependent. Yeah. Can you back to well, we wish we could do that. So in Tennessee, so in, 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 in some sense, what we're doing is we could use the heat from the machine to heat the building, right? It's not a very efficient way of heating the building. So uh, it turns out that we don't, our buildings are very efficient to begin with, so we don't really need to take advantage of that. The biggest problem that we have uh, um, that, that Jim Rogers has to face in terms of his utilization of energy is taking the water out of the air in East Tennessee. It's actually conditioning the air that's the most expensive part. So for the rooftop engine, Fox Cox will fly for a while. But when I look at our other sustainability measures, we don't seem to be looking at flight consumption. Is there a better metric that we should be doing in enterprise to look at performance per unit hour? You're saying carbon. You're, you're saying is there a way to measure carbon, the use of carbon per no, per? What I'm saying is if I have a smaller machine room, if I want to meet sustainability goal, I'm often told don't go over 100 amps, whereas I should be saying something like, yeah, so, so we're actually, if you look at the other um, machine room that we're building in the annex, if you look at the, most of you are familiar with the CSBX, the annex part that we just built out as uh, uh, part, of, uh, um, part of our growth, um, that machine room on the second floor actually starts to look some, something similar to what you're talking about, John, because it's got the concept of pods and the concept that you can, you can isolate uh, systems from the surrounding environment. Okay, and you can basically monitor, you can put your power along those pods and you can monitor the power that's associated with those pods. So starting to think in those terms. Other questions? Yeah. It was a miracle. 
<laughs> no, it actually was coincidence. When, when we first got that number, so you know, we had to turn the number in the Friday before uh, supercomputing. Okay? And to be honest, we had just finished the upgrade of Titan. And we were having all kinds of problems keeping it up for long enough to run the, the Limpack for an hour. You know, it takes about an hour to run that thing. And so we, we got the first number, the first real number at over 17 came in on Friday afternoon. Okay, and it was like 17.2. Then we got a number that was like 17.48 around dinner time, right? And then I got a call later that evening about 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock, 17.59. And we were all like, Wow, that's pretty cool, you know? Exactly 10 times the performance of Jaguar in three years. It's coincidence, and it's a miracle, okay? Now, we can do better, to be honest. We can do better, because if you think about it, it's a 27.1 petaflop machine, and if we could sustain on the order of 80% efficiency like a lot of the other systems, then we can do a lot more than 17.59. And so in that particular calculation, we're not using any of the CPUs. We're only using the GPUs, okay? And so we can do better in terms of the optimization. You know, it's like, could we have made, traded some people around and actually made this calculation faster? Yeah, we could have. And it's the same kind of thing. We can optimize the, the processor and the, and the algorithm to the CPU plus the GPU and get a better number. Okay, so we're, we'll get a better number than 17.59 if we want to dedicate the machine, you know, to, to doing that for a while. 80% of theoretical max is about what most machines come in at. If you look at the Blue Gene system at Livermore, it's about 80%. You know, these kinds of systems are a lot harder. If you look at the Chinese machine that's both CPU and GPU, it was lucky to break 50% of the peak theoretical. Okay. I don't know what we're at, 65 or 70 percent, something like that right now. 17.59 divided by 27.1. Yeah. Yeah. But we can, I think we can do a little bit better. We can get over 20. Other questions? We've got one more minute. So I read in Noxmuse.com that we have an acceptance. That's right. Acceptance, but we're still using it. So the, so the acceptance has three pieces to it, right? And so we're in the middle of that acceptance testing, and it has to pass an ex, a performance test, it has to pass a functionality test, and it has, to perf, uh, it has to pass a stability test. So that means it has to run for like 14 days without going down every hour, okay? And that's the part that it's still trying to achieve. One last question, Jim. Right, exascale, that's a good question. So what we want to do is we want to deliver the next machine in 2016, and we want it to be about another factor of 10 times more powerful than the machine today. So if we can field a machine that's about 200 to 300 petaflops, that would be our prototype exascale system in 2016. And then four years later in 2020, we would want another factor of 10, which would get us into the exascale two to three exaflops. Okay, the idea would be to sustain an exaflop in that 2020 time frame. Okay, now, that's going to be really hard. Because remember how many threads we already have on Titan, 50 million threads. So we're going to, going to be up to a billion threads on an exascale machine. And so the programmers that are sitting out here doing fusion or fission, they have to start thinking about how am I going to program a billion threads in order to do my science. And that's really, really hard. Plus, there's all the issues associated with power. You know, how do I, do I have another processor coming that's going to replace the GPU with something that's 10 times more powerful? What's the next, what's the processor in these smartphones? ARM? Okay. How many of these smartphones would I have to have? If this is 150 megaflops, how many do I have to have to get to an exaflop? 150 million. Okay. So I've got to do how many? I got to have a trillion of these things, okay? And I got to have a trillion of these things, and it's going to get hotter than what I'm capable of putting in my pocket, okay? So then I have to cool it down. So ARM processors might be something that I can think about. Maybe ARM in conjunction with GPUs might get me another factor of 10. But I got to have two factors of 10 in the next eight years, right? 
So I've got a lot of work to do in order to be able to get there for exascale. And it's going to cost several hundred million dollars a year for us to get to exascale. Okay? All right. I think that's probably all I have time for. It's been great, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about sustainable computing again sometime. Thanks. Thanks.